Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward. I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James grounded family Bible study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. Genesis chapter 40. 40 in the Bible is a test. We see Calvary. There are three men. One man, Jesus Christ. We see two people who have violated the law, the government. One dies and one lives. Chapter 40. And it came to pass after these things that Joseph had been put into prison, that the butler of the king of Egypt, the guy that we'll see later takes care of the food and the drinks of the, of the king, Pharaoh, and his baker, the guy who makes bread, had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Everyone's sometime or anything is going to be offended, and the king who gets offended, he throws him in jail. And that may happen to Christians. That has happened to Christians. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers. Against the chief of the butlers and the, against the chief of the bakers. What is their offense? They offended the king somehow. Not so hard. And he, the Pharaoh, put them in ward. This is where you get the word warden from. Though we don't use that term no more. We gotta raise more letters to titles so we can give them more money, but warden comes from the Bible. In the house of the captain of the guard, into the prison. Now look at that. He put them in ward, in the house of the captain of the guard. The man that's in charge of the prison lives at the prison. He doesn't go home. He has a house there. And when we read Acts 16.31, and the, and the warden, I forget what they, have, what they call him there. He's about to kill himself because he wakes up and all the, all the gates are open. He thinks there's no prisoners. And Paul speaks up and says, hey, no, no, don't kill yourself. He comes in probably on his knees and says, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he brings them home and washes their stripes. There is his home right there in the prison. Scripture with Scripture. The place where Joseph was bound. He's shackled. He has no freedom. I mean, he's not bound to a chair, but he can go only so far. He can only do so much. As much as the, the, the prisoners have put in charge of him, he's probably got his hands free, but the Bible says in the book of Psalms, they hurt his wrist. He's bound. I've been many years in the prison ministry. They walk around without handcuffs. They don't have leg uh, shackles. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them. Here's these two men that come into prison. Joseph, yeah, you're in charge of these two men. And he served them. And they continue a season in the ward. So Joseph is faithful in doing work in the prison. And he has two men put under his authority. And they dream a dream, both of them. Each man his dream in one night. 
Now, what happens the rest of this chapter here, this has to be a dream beyond any dream. Because not, you're going to dream, and then, okay, wake up, okay, everybody, let's get the dream book, let's get the interpretation. Not every dream has interpretation. But these dreams are used by God, and they speak to the men as dreams by God do. And somebody, we got to do something about this dream. But not every dream has interpretation. And they dreamed the dream, both of them. Each man his dream in one night. So that night, they went to bed, they dreamed. Each man according to the interpretation of his dream. The butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. The butler that serves the wine will live. The baker that makes the bread will die. There's something in that if we're looking at Calvary. What? I don't know. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. Christ is not on the cross in the morning. In the morning, he's standing before Pilate. And he's judged. And he's questioned. And he's put to trial. And he, uh, okay, where was I? He was seven. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house. So there's still Pharaoh's officers. Wherefore look ye so sad today? Why are you not sadly today? And let's see what Luke 24 17 has. I got a note there. Let's see what that is. Luke 24 17. I don't know. So if it's not going to say anything until we get there. If it's a good verse, it's a good verse. If it's not, well, we're going through the Bible. Luke 24 17. And he said unto them, Jesus speaking, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as they walk and they are sad? So here's the two men walking on the road in the eminence. And Jesus comes up and says, Hey guys, why are you so sad? Again, Joseph, the type of Jesus Christ. Here are two men. These two men represent much going on in the New Testament. That's a good verse. And they said unto him, now this is not the road of the amendments, but we have dreamed the dream. So they're telling Joseph what happened as the road to amendments. With Jesus. They're telling Jesus what happened. Like Jesus didn't know. Jesus is involved. And there is no interpreter of it. Now, like I said, I don't think this is just a normal dream. Man, if you look at my dreams, the ones I do remember, I don't think I would want to know interpretation of There's no sense of getting one of them books or having somebody, because we have a finished Bible. We are not given those dreams. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that, I forget where it says, but God says, while a man sleeps, he settles into his mind and into his heart what God has prepared for him, and then he seals it, and he, when you wake up, you don't even know God spoke to you. We're not under dream. Well, I see dreams in Genesis. Okay. Right now, in Genesis chapter 40, bring to Joseph the baker and the butler. Bring to them a King James 1611 Bible. Bring them a Geneva Bible. Bring them the writings of Paul, Paul's epistles. Okay, no, wait a minute. Bring them the book of Genesis. It ain't there. The only thing you probably could bring them, if it's written, and I don't know, is the book of Job. I don't think they want that book in prison. <laughs> That'd be like a prisoner open up a fortune cookie and say, you'll find new love today. No, no, no. The only book, if it's actually written at that time, would be Job. We already saw that through the line of Esau. There is no Genesis. So if there's no written account of the Bible, God's Word, how does God speak to His people? Through visions, through dreams. But when the book is sealed, 
God tells him, go out there in, in Mark chapter 16 and, and heal them, and you shall drink, uh, snakes will attack you, you'll live, and do this and do that to confirm the word. Because there is no word. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not written into the epistles of Acts. Luke has not written his Luke. Acts have not been written because Luke writes Acts. So assure the Jews on what the word of God is. Jews require a sign. Joseph is a Jew. How can God speak to Joseph? All right, here's two men. Here's a sign. I will give you the capability of discerning prayers. How's that, Joseph? So God is speaking to Joseph in a prison after he's been maliciously in, in, in charge with rape that he did nothing. Now he's in prison. God says, hey, I'm with you. Oh, God, you uh, here I am. All right, just wait. Hold on. I'm going to send two men to you. I'll show you a sign I'm with you, okay? Oh, okay. And they said, we have dreamed a dream. Some other man tried to, I have dreamed. And caused all kinds of ruckus. And there is no interpreter of it. Now watch this. And Joseph said unto him, do not interpretations belong to books at the bookstore. Go, go, go buy this book by this guy. And he'll tell you that a dragon means this. And get yourself a dream catcher. And if you dream of snails, you're going to be slow for the rest of your life. No. Do not interpretations belong to the psychic at the flea market. No. Don't go running to those people. Do not interpretations belong to God. So what am I to do in 2017 as a born-again Bible-believing Christian? God, I'm reading your Bible. I don't understand that. Oh, I'll do it. I'll get a commentary. I'll get this guy's book. I'll listen to this guy's tape. I will go to hear this guy personally. No. God, I don't understand this passage. This is your Bible. I do not know it all. I am lacking in wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. I need your help. And there are places in my Bible where I have a question mark and where God has not yet shown me the interpretation of that passage. And he may not ever show me that interpretation. I do not have the full power of interpretation. God does. Now there have been questions, there have been things in the Bible that I had raised to other Christians. Who I know love the Bible, who I know read the Bible, and know God. And they, their advice would be good. But those men, as I believe, would also pray to God. Say, God, you know, this question came up by his brethren. And, yeah, this is kind of interesting. What's the answer? I always try to go scripture with scripture when I have a question about the Bible. And the last thing I will do is I will go to a commentary. And sometimes the commentaries will help because they are men of God. So, interpretations belong to God so when you get somebody who says well if you do it this way and it doesn't match the Bible they're false deceivers they are false prophets God is not the author of confusion tell me them I pray you and the chief butler the guys ahead of the cup told his dream to Joseph this guy would represent the blood of Jesus Christ. Because we're talking about a cup. Jesus said, here, take this cup. It is the cup of the New Testament, the blood. Not, not what's in the cup. The cup. You're going to find Nehemiah in charge of a cup with a king. Scripture with Scripture. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said unto him, In my dream, behold, a vine. You know what a vine is in the Bible? Israel. Jesus said, A man planted a vineyard, put a hedge about it, put a wine tower in the middle of it, and the, and the, and the, the vine, the grapes went bad. It's Israel. This is loaded. 
a vine with three br three branches. Come on, God, you had a chance between zero, between negative infirmity to positive infirmities of numbers, and you chose three. And we got three men. We're going to see three days. We're going to see three vines. We're going to see three baked meat uh, baskets. We're going to see three days. Three, 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 three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In chapter 40, let's test. Probationary time. Israel was put to a probation in 40 years of traveling through the wilderness. <clears throat> 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus and Moses and the other one, I forget who, fasted. So, there's a vine with three branches. And it was as though it budded flowers. And her blossoms, the flowers. The bud is the little green thing that's closed. The, the, the blossoms is actually flowered. Shot for it. It's got life. It's producing fruit. And the clusters. That's the grapes itself. This thing is budding. It's got flowers and it has grapes. Therefore brought forth ripe grapes. So in this dream he starts off. Here's a vine. It's got a bud. It opens up to a flower and turns into grapes. Ooh, interesting dream. And in the vine were three branches, and it was thought budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. Not sour grapes. Ripe grapes. That's interesting. Get that for the next verse. Ripe grapes. And we'll shoot down religions with this one. And Pharaoh's cup, this is the king, this is his cup. Nobody touches his cup but this man and Pharaoh. Because anybody could poison this cup. And practices and stories rely on how true they are that this butler would taste that wine in the eyes of Pharaoh that and it would be if he didn't die, it's safe for Pharaoh. This butler we're going to see, he takes the materials and makes the wine. No one else. Because there could be other hands that pick the grapes. And somebody could have poisoned it at that time. So, Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. No one else touches that cup. God has a cup of for nations to drink. Jesus Christ gave a cup to the disciples. Jesus prayed in the garden that cup. Sins. Mike Pat. Not death. Sins. You know what most cases you would put into a cup like this? Though not the case here. You would put hooch. You would put alcohol. You would put strong drink in a cup. That represents sin. All the Christians have, have alcohol. Jesus said that cup. What's in that cup? So he takes the cup. I took the grapes. Get the right grapes. Right grapes. I took the grapes. Come right off the cluster. Maybe the butler even picked the grapes. And no one else touched. Maybe he goes out to the vineyard. Alright, this cluster looks good. Got to protect the king. He took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. Gets the right grapes. He presses. He's making new wine. He is making grape juice. It has no time to ferment. He is not serving the king alcohol. He is serving him pure grape juice that you can't even find in the grocery store shelf. And if you ever have taken, I had a juicer at one time. If you ever go to the store and buy grapes and then you put them through that juicer, oh. Now, I don't know if I could do some advertising here or get in trouble. Welch's has got the best grape juice. But if you were to take grapes and put them through a juicer, it's delicious. Press them into Pharaoh's cup. And I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. So it's this is this is the Bible, new wine. 
This would be the wine that Jesus served at the marriage supper. It is great tasting. It is fresh. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now what can you get from three days from Calvary? What happens to the butler? He comes. He survives. He lives. And uh, three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head and restore thee unto thy place. You're going to get your job back. Your head's going to be highly exalted. That's Jesus Christ. After three days, he, he he walked about Jerusalem. He got victory over Satan. He got victory over death. He is exalted. He's pleased the Father. He has it all. And he'll be going back to heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Look at that. Thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou was his butler. You're going back to do what you're doing. Jesus will go back and do what he does. Sit in heaven be glorified in heaven. But even more. But think on me when it shall be well with thee. And show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. And make mention of me unto Pharaoh. And bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews. So there are Hebrews. Before Exodus, God told Moses, put Hebrews there. And here also have I done nothing. Now, I said, like I said, I've been in the prison ministry. They will all profess they've done nothing. I had one time, it was one of my first, I think, within three messages I were to give it to prison. It was the first month and then four four weeks in a month. So within four messages, I had this great idea. I was going to show the man salvation, the grace of God, and to show how you can be saved and be under no condemnation by the blood of Jesus. And I was going to ask the men, and we had about 15 men, I believe it was. I was going to say, how many men in this room have never done anything wrong? Now, I was thinking... No one was going to raise their hand. And I was going to show them how Jesus Christ can make them clean and make them absolutely free for 1 John 1 5. So I said, okay, men in this room, how many of you in this room are completely innocent? Every single hand shot up. And I remember the correction officer, he was he was laughing because he knew where I was going. <laughs> and he looked at me like, okay, what are you going to do now? And it's like, I never expected that. I never will. I don't know. I never will forget that, Lord willing. But Joseph is right. And you know what? Some of those men that raised their hands, maybe they were telling the truth. And we know by the story of God and through the Holy Spirit, he was innocent. And this is the only time he <coughs> complains. What a complaint! His complaint, his gripe is the truth. Well, how's that? When the chief butler, butler ugh, chief baker saw that the interpretation was good. Oh, that was great. Now mine's going to be good. A little pride there. He said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream. Now you can't take a type 100% and I can't take this baker 100% on Calvary. So, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head I can't do it and but I do know that when Jesus fed the 500 uh, 5,000 he told them to gather and put them in the baskets and in the uppermost basket the highest one there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh bun pastries, bread, 
and the birds. You know what the birds are, type in Mark chapter 4. Satan, the devil, did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Oh, this is almost like the parable of the sower that went out and spread the word of God. Seeds. And Satan immediately showed up. Well, Satan shows up after the butler. And the birds are eating the bread off his head. So when he shows up before Pharaoh, I've got for you nothing. I had something, but oh man. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets, not the bread. The three baskets. I can't take that. I don't know. Are three days. Three days. And yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee. Now look what he said to the to the, the butler in verse 13. Pharaoh shall lift up thy head. Verse 19. Pharaoh shall lift up thy head from off thee. The difference is one guy is going to have a little authority raised up in power. One is going to have his head completely removed. Lift up thy head from off thee and shall hang it, hang them, uh, hang thee on a tree across Calvary. If you look at the old westerns, they hanged you on gallows. When you read the book of Esther, he made gallows for Mordecai. Here, it's not gallows, it's a tree, Calvary. Isn't that interesting? Of all the things that could have been said, a tree. And the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. Now, we know that's not what happens in to the unrepented thief because they took their bodies down because it was the, the holiday, the celebration. So you cannot press a type 100%. And it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. That he made a feast Unto all his servants. Birthday cake, little horns wearing on the hats, and ooh, birthday. Everyone that has a birthday in the Bible makes their own birthday party. How conceited. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief butler among the servants. Butler, yes, sir. All right, you're back to work again. Um, just take your position and bring me my grape juice. Bring me my new wine. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and he restored the chief butler onto his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. He's back serving Pharaoh. But he, Pharaoh, hanged the chief baker. Every birthday in the Bible, someone died. John the Baptist lost his head. This guy gets hung by his neck. Jeremiah and Job cursed the day they were born. And yet you will find in a Baptist church, forget Catholics, forget Episcopalians, forget Jehovah's Witnesses, you will find in a Baptist church, this person has a birthday, let's get up and all saying happy birthday to you. Or let's honor this person because today they're 40 years old and... The Bible never praises one's birth. And the fact is, it is not your birthday. Every human being has one birthday, and that's it. Problem is, if you have one birthday, you die and go to hell. You need to be born again. Why doesn't a Baptist church celebrate the rebirth of a man rather than being born into sin? If you're going to celebrate a birthday, why not celebrate when a person was born again? Why celebrate the birth as you became a sinner? How about that? Put that in your Baptist Chronicles. 
Put that in your Baptist church. Oh, we believe the King James Bible, and yet we do birthdays. No, you don't believe the King James Bible. And I said that. You sign my name to it, and I'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and probably Jesus say, attaboy. Well done. Because there's nothing good in the Bible about a birthday. Everyone that's born on a birthday comes out screaming and crying. You know, the day that Jesus Christ was born was the beginning of his troubles. And he was sinless. He was born to suffer and die on that cross. And he restored the butler against his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief butler. Now this is where it makes Joseph a prophet of Jesus Christ, of God. As Joseph have interpreted to them. What's the law say? A prophet is somebody who has said something and it comes to pass. A false prophet, he said something and it don't come to pass. You know how many years Jonah was a false prophet? Jonah walked, ran into Nineveh and said, God's going to destroy this place. He went underneath this tree and sat there. God, hello? I'm a false prophet, God. It wasn't years and years later that God destroyed Nineveh. Then jo jo uh, Jonah became a prophet of God. God said in his law, if a prophet says something and it does not come to pass, you are a false prophet. Joseph is a prophet of God in prison who had all kinds of troubles in prophet. Joseph, do you now know that I'm with you? Yes, Lord. But I'm still in prison. Now, we'll take care of that. You know he prayed to God just like he, he said to the butler. The butler would be Pharaoh's most important servant because the life of Pharaoh besides the one who makes his dinner there's all kinds through history rulers were killed by poison one famous guy was, was killed by Hemlock um, I mean, I say Hem Hemlock so if you're going to talk to somebody about your life you talk to somebody whose life is in their hand do you realize how hard it would have been for Nehemiah's request to be done before the king and the queen. You know what Nehemiah stood for? I'm protecting you, king. I have protected you, king. I have made sure that what I put before you is not poison. Can I leave go to Jerusalem? And the king would be like, Who else can I trust to do this job? Yeah, go ahead and do it. You think about that? Had Pharaoh killed this guy, the butler, that next drink, ooh, can I trust that guy who's doing it? Now, I can trust this butler. Now, this guy with the bread meat, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph but forget him. Oh, man. Isn't that how it always go? Joseph's probably saying, oh, yeah, he's going to say something to Pharaoh. Things are going to go well. And then he's sitting there like four days, a week, a couple weeks. Well, didn't say nothing, did he? Still in his prison.